Hallelujah. Be here. Amen. Appreciate the Lord, His goodness and His mercy and His grace toward us. And uh, we ain't got no burl preacher. I'm sorry. Amen. So uh, I am limited here. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Daniel this morning. And uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off last year. So I hope you remember what we were saying last year. And uh, Daniel chapter number nine. And uh, give you a thought, maybe just try to help us, maybe exhort us a little bit this morning uh, in the area of prayer. And uh, of course, we can always use some prompting in that area. Daniel chapter number nine. Uh, when you find your place, we'll stand this morning in reverence to the Word of God. We'll begin reading in verse number one this morning. And the Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of uh, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face in the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. And I want you to take notice this morning. If you study Daniel uh, brethren, there's nothing that we can find any accusations against Daniel this morning. Uh, that crowd couldn't find any accusations in chapter number six right. concerning his job. Daniel was a very faithful man. In order to find anything against him, they had to lie against this man, a very clean man, right. uh, a good man. But notice Daniel does not point the finger at Israel and say they have sinned. But he says, we have sinned. Right. We have committed iniquity. We have, we've done this. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to just preach this morning out of this. And I want to look at what profited or prompted uh, uh, the old prophet to pray. And I say that respectfully about Daniel. And I say that for us to recognize this morning that Daniel is not a young buck in this chapter. Daniel right. Right. is over 90 years old when he is here praying in this chapter this morning. And uh, I want us to see this, prompted to pray. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Fathers, we come before this morning in Jesus' name. We do thank you, God, for your goodness, your mercy. Lord, your amazing grace. Father, I pray that you'd take the message. Lord, help us this morning. Encourage us in the area of prayer, Father. We need help in this area. Lord, I bet help us to have a burden, Father. And we'll give you all the glory and honor and praise this morning as we pray. And thank you in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. I want to deal with several things and try and see through the Word of God and see if we can see this morning through the Scriptures uh, what brought the prophet, the man of God, Daniel, uh, to this place in chapter number 9 as we find him praying and setting his face toward the God of heaven. Now, as you study this, there are several things that we'll look at this morning, and I'll try to give this to you and uh, be a blessing to you this morning as we look at this. Uh, but there are several things that I would like to look at as we begin to look at this. And I want you to notice uh, in our text this morning, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, uh, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the rim of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now, we'll notice in verse number one this morning as we begin to dig into this passage of Scripture that the Bible is very clear in giving us this account when this happened. Though we do not have the exact month or the day that this happened, we do have the year that this happened. And the Bible says in the first year to rise. And as you study your Bible, you'll find that uh, basically as you study the book of Daniel, you'll find that it does lay in chronological order up into a certain point, about to chapter number 5. 
And then you'll find that the chapters preceding that, uh, the chronological order begins to jump around a little bit as far as the dates are concerned in the book of Daniel. And uh, knowing that and understanding that, you'll find that some of these later chapters just very evident as we begin to look in chapter number 8. The Bible says in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. Now we know that cha this chapter actually precedes uh, chapter number 5 as Belshazzar has done been sat down by the providence of God. Now as we look at this this morning and begin to dig into this time period, I want you to notice this morning that the politics of Daniel's time stirred him to the prayer closet that he is in here in chapter number 9. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, when you begin to look in chapter number one, we find Nebuchadnezzar coming in and besieging Jerusalem according to the prophecies of Jeremiah the prophet and Isaiah himself. And brethren, as you study that and you go down through the book of Daniel and you see these things transpiring, and in chapter number five, uh, we'll notice that as we read through chapter number five, brethren, I'm afraid a lot of times just because of chapter divisions, uh, we miss some things that have transpired. What we need to understand from chapter number five to chapter number six is a world empire has just changed hands. Brethren, that is a very large happening as you study this. Brethren, when you read in verse chapter number six and verse number one, the Bible says it pleased the rise to sit over the kingdom 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. So here they are establishing the kingdom after they have came in, took over and the Mede-Persian Empire the head of gold has now fallen off the image and we are stepping into the next area of that image. Brethren as you study this and look at this uh, and you look at Belshazzar and you look at the prophecies and you look at the things that have transpired brethren this is a very very large happening here in the book of Daniel. Now we need to apply that to our times in the day that we live in. Brethren, you know as well as I do that there are some very large happenings uh, stirring among our politics. We can choose to stick our head in the sand this morning and not acknowledge the things that are going on. But brethren, it is time that we take notice to the things that are stirring even amongst our politics in this day. And I am far from being a politician and understanding everything that is transpiring. But brethren, I am telling you this morning, even wicked folk, even folk that don't know God, as we would say this morning, I question as we price jobs and deal with people, I ask just almost everybody nowadays, sir, what do you think about the politics of our day? And then in that, try to proceed into the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brethren, even wicked folk know that it cannot continue uh, as it is. And as Bible believers, we know what is transpiring, church. We know what is happening as we do see the politics and we see uh, Russia and China and Gog and Magog and the things moving in the place. Brethren, I'm going to say as we look at Daniel and we see from chapter number five, in one night God transferred the kingdom without the first shot being fired. Brethren, you study on in Cyrus and you look as God sent Cyrus down there and you can read a lot of history about this man by the name of Darius. Some say that he was Cyrus's father-in-law but nonetheless we know that he is one of his generals that has been sent in who was made king over the rim at that time until Cyrus got down there and took charge of everything. But brethren, even Cyrus on his grave today in a museum in England, he knows and he acknowledged that God shepherded him in the taking of Babylon. And he says that God walked with him as a friend. Isaiah 150 years before this uh, chapter number 5 transpired. God calls Cyrus by name and says, my shepherd, my anointed one will go in and he will rebuild Jerusalem. So brethren as we study this this morning and as God and as you study Babylon one of the greatest ancient cities of our time and this uh, on the earth as we look at this this morning. Walls that were 300 foot tall, uh, 80 foot thick, buried 30 foot up in the ground
down, impassable. Nobody could take it. The city sat in within them walls a quarter mile, strategically placed within it. Nobody could fight against it. Nobody could besiege it. They had enough on that city to last a long time. But Cyrus, by the providence of God, was up on the upper end of that Euphrates River, diverted that river, walked through that river channel, and overtook Babylon uh, that night without the first shot being fired. Why Daniel was reading the handwriting on the wall and interpreting it that night, Cyrus and his army and Darius, that general, was marching down that riverbed by the providence of God. And I'm telling you, brethren, I'm not, I'm not a doomsday preacher, but I am a Bible believer. And I'm telling you, Cyrus is marching down the riverbed in our day, and God's plan is taking place, and God's a moving, and he's placing, and he is a sovereign God. Yes, I do believe that this morning. Brethren, I'm gonna say uh, that the politics of Daniel's day began to stir him. Not only the politics began to stir this prophet of God in the area of prayer, but brethren, when you study Daniel, prophecy began to promote this man. Brethren, you go back about in chapter number two and Daniel has interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. God shows that dear old prophet or a young man at that time and he shows him the world empires through a pagan king's dream and through that dream, Nebuchadnezzar is troubled and he's upset and he does not understand what is transpiring and the only two kingdoms in that chapter are named in that chapter and that one being of Nebuchadnezzar being that head of gold but there was another kingdom mentioned in that chapter uh, along with the other Gentile nations but there was another kingdom that stands out a kingdom whose end will never come an everlasting kingdom brethren I am telling you that is the kingdom that we are a part of that is the kingdom that we are looking for this morning. And that prophet of God, chapter number two, could you imagine dwelling in that man's mind throughout the years, them prophecies, that statue, a stone cut out of a mountain, uh, uh, crashing into that uh, image and crushing it to the ground, an everlasting kingdom that will never end. Could you imagine what is stirring in the prophet of God's mind? You go to chapter number seven, and several years later, Nebuchadnezzar is reigned, his son is reigned, and now his grandson is in his steed and during those years the Bible says in chapter number 7 in the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon Daniel had a dream and here he is years down the road almost 70 years later and brethren here he is almost at the end of this thing and God begins to work in the man of God's life again shows in the world empires again and he names a little bit more of it and a little bit more of the puzzle comes together for Daniel. Brethren, I'm going to say this morning, the further we go in this thing, the more the puzzle is fitting together in the eyes of God and working toward that blessed day and the imminent return of our Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, church, there is a king coming, hallelujah. There is a kingdom coming this morning. Notice this in, in chapter number seven. In the first year of Belshazzar, God gives the man of God a little bit more prophecy. Could you imagine all that stirring in the mind of this man by the name of Daniel? Chapter number eight, the Bible says in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, two years later, God gives him a little bit more. God just basically calls uh, 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 that Grecian. He gives us names and he gives Daniel just a little bit more and names a couple more and gives him a little bit more information about the things that are fixing to transpire. Could you imagine church as these things are stirring in the mind of this man? The head of gold has been took it off. The Mede-Persian empire has stepped in place. Could you imagine how the prophet felt? Could you imagine how excited he was? Brethren, I know they think we crazy, but the more that happens uh, and the more missiles they shoot uh, and the more 
more Russia comes down and fights uh, and the more they persecute Israel and the more they transpire and the worse men get. I know it sounds psychotic, but I'm telling you the more excited I'm getting, brethren, because there is some prophecy on the inside of me this morning that stirs me to believe uh, that our king is coming, church. Brethren, the more that prophecy you put on the inside of you, the more you're going to be stirred. I'm not depressed about evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. It is prophecy. I'm not discouraged about all the infidels, and I'm not discouraged about all the false prophets. Yes, we're against them. Yes, we're trying to do right. But I'm telling you, brethren, our redemption is drawing nigh this morning. So we see prophecy stirred the man of God to this place of prayer. But not only did prophecy stir Daniel to this position in chapter number 9, in the first year to rise the son of Hazarias, more than likely, we cannot prove it, but more than likely, chapter 6 and chapter number 9 were in the same year as that king is establishing his kingdom. And Daniel wound up, we know, is it an amazing? They don't hardly know this man by the name of Daniel, and they put him third in charge. And brethren, as we began to look at this this morning, I want you to see, and I'm trying to just get one good thing out here as we look at this. And I want you to notice this morning, not only the politics, and not only prophecy stirred Daniel, but I am telling you the pages of the Word of God stirred this man to the area of prayer. Look at it with me. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books what books you think Daniel had in his head, church. We can't lay down for certain exactly what Daniel had. But I tell you, we can prove through the Word of God that he had the law of God. And I'm telling you, he had this. Now look at it as he stood there. And the Bible says, and I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years. And I'm telling you, church, uh, hey, prayer will complement your Bible reading. Uh, and Bible reading will will compliment your prayer life. Has it ever dawned on you while you're praying? Has it ever dawned on you this morning? We'll get to praying and we'll start quoting scripture uh, like we're trying to remind God of his promises. But what you need to understand is that's not us reminding God, but it is a God in heaven reminding us of his promises. And the pages begin to stir him. The scriptures begin to stir Daniel. And brethren, as he began to read through the Word of God and look at the Word of God, man, God began to stir this man's heart. The prophecies that are in his mind, man, the things that have transpired in Daniel's life up until this time. Do you realize that Daniel chapter number four, the account we have of Nebuchadnezzar, his testimony of what God did for him, I believe the old boy got saved, amen. Do you realize this morning that what we read in Daniel chapter number four went to the entire then known world at that time when he put out a decree, brethren, he said to all nations, languages, and tongues, I'm telling you, Nebuchadnezzar gave his testimony to everybody, everybody receive what we read in Daniel 4. It was sent out that day. Amen. Could you imagine the thing stirring this whole prophet of God? And brethren, as he is in chapter number 9, over 90 years old, brethren, stirred to pray, right. stirred to walk with God. And in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, he got in the pages of the scriptures. And brethren, not only do we see the politics stirring this man, and we see the prophecy stirring this man. And we see the pages of the scripture stirring this man. But I want you to notice the prophet of God is stirring this man. Not only is he reading in pages and looking in church, look at him, the old prophet still affecting him. Jeremiah's off the scenes now. And brethren, you look at the prophet of God. Brethren, notice this. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years where the Lord of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Not just any scriptures, but brethren, his preacher, hallelujah, Jeremiah the prophet. You read in Jeremiah 29, and it is a letter to the residue of them that have been sent to Babylon. And that letter, no doubt, reached the eyes of Daniel and reached the eyes of that man. And in Daniel's hands in Babylon, 
blood. He's got a copy of the writings of Jeremiah. He said, I understood by the writings of Jeremiah. And so all these politics stirring, all these prophecies stirring. And I know this is the prophet of God, Jeremiah, and it is a prophecy. But he got to reading and Jeremiah said, there's going to be 70 years. Boy, Jeremiah got hung out over the, hung over over that one. They beat him. They mocked him. Jeremiah said, that one prophet come out in chapter number 27, or 27, Jeremiah made the yokes of bonds and he sent them out. And that one false prophet by the name of Hezekiah came out and said, listen, it's only going to be two years and the vessels will be coming back and we'll all be coming back. And Jeremiah, I don't know if he's being sarcastic or not. Jeremiah said, amen, even so. Jeremiah said, I like the way that sounds and it does sound good, but it is not so. And it's like our day. It don't matter what we say or we do. The only way this thing's getting better is for the king to come. We can't preach and say that it's going to get better. And, and, I'm not, and I pray for this. Don't y'all mark me off for saying what I'm fixing to say. There's no promise of a great revival in the last day. But I'm praying for it. And I'm begging God for it. And I hope it happens. Amen. But there are some things that are promised in the word of God and that is said. And he said, the world will hate you. They hated me, they'll hate you. I'm gonna tell you something, that is gonna get worse. He gets back here and he begins reading. Jeremiah said, 70 years. Well, the preacher was right. That false prophet by the name of Hezekiah took those bonds and yokes off Jeremiah's neck in chapter 28 and bust them. And they mocked the man of God and they put him in the stocks and bonds and they mistreated him, put him in prison. But the old prophet was right. And here Daniel is in chapter number nine. I'll close with this. We got about five minutes left here. I'll let you all eat. Hallelujah. And he says, and I understood by the word the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Not only was the politics stirring Daniel, the prophecy stirring Daniel. The pages of the scripture stirring Daniel. And even the old prophet himself stirring Daniel. But the promises were stirring Daniel. Let me give you this this morning as we look at this. I'd like to go a little further. You say, what do you mean promises? Go back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse number 14. Brethren, when you go back to Dad, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14, God is responding to Solomon's prayer. And as God is responding, when you read chapter number 6 and 7, and you read all of this in the context of verse 14, of chapter 7, verse 14, man, they in the midst of jubilee. And it sounds like when God responds to them, you need revival. But they are in the midst of jubilee. The glory has failed. The Shekinah glory has failed. But Solomon has prayed at the dedication of the temple. And Solomon asked God eight things. And in that prayer, he asked him, and I'm just going to read the last one. And you'll find eight times that he asked God and he begs God to hear from heaven. Then hear thou from heaven, verse 23. Hear thou from thy dwelling place, even heaven, verse 21. 25, then hear thou from the heavens. And all the way down through there, he gives different things. And he says, if your people go to war and somebody pray, turn and pray toward this place. Hear from heaven. And the last one of these is Daniel's. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not. And thou be angry with them and deliver them over before their enemies. And they shall carry them away captives unto a land far off or near. Now listen. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned. What did the old prophet say? We have sinned. And Daniel wasn't just spurting off at the mouth. Daniel was praying on this. 
And you'll find that Solomon ended his prayer and several days went by and God showed back up to Solomon by night and the stipulation that God gave to Solomon for him to hear from heaven. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Daniel did every one of those. Look at him. Sat cloth and ashes, we find humility. I set my face. He bethought himself in the land of his captivity and thought about the people of God and turned his face. And brethren, as you study that and look at that, Solomon said, if they will turn toward this place. In Daniel chapter number six, as Daniel has been accused, falsely accused and lied upon, we see just a little bit of Daniel's prayer there. And the Bible says that Daniel prayed three times a day as he did a four time. And the Bible gives us a little description of how Daniel prayed. He went into his chamber. And ain't it amazing that God gave him a window in the palace of Babylon? God gave the man a place to pray. And the Bible says he kneeled down as he did three times a day. And the Bible says, and he turned toward Jerusalem. Just like Solomon said, if they will turn toward this place, if somebody will bethank themselves and pray, and the old prophet is praying on that promise. Yes. Amen. And he turns toward Jerusalem and he prays. And he says just what Solomon said. He starts out his prayer. We have sinned. We have sinned. We have sinned. And then God answers Solomon and says, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And brethren, you find every bit of that in Daniel's prayer in chapter number 9. You find the prophecies stirring, the politics. You find the pages of the Scripture stirring him. You find the prophet. Man, we ain't got time this morning as we wind this thing down. But in Daniel or Jeremiah 29, the old prophet instructs Daniel to pray. He says, you pray for the peace of that land and you pray for them. Yes. Brethren, y'all reckon Nebuchadnezzar, you reckon chapter number four might have come out of them prayers? I did it one time, and I may have said this last year, but I'm going to tell you something. If Daniel kneeled down three times a day and prayed, Nebuchadnezzar reigned 25 years. And if you do the numbers on that, three times a year Daniel prayed, and if he called Nebuchadnezzar's name, that comes out to about 43,000 something other times that Daniel kneeled down and prayed and asked God, and that ain't including 21 days of fasting and prayer, of all day praying. I'm telling you, and if you study it, God let this prophet in on praying the nation going back to Jerusalem. We like to pop our spiritual suspenders and say, wow, look what we prayed in. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if we'll ever grasp a hold of all prayer is, is God letting you in on what he's wanting yeah. to do. Because yeah. the Holy Ghost prays through us, church. And I'm telling you, when you're in real Holy Ghost prayer, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Best way I know to describe it's like driving a big truck when you lay into the throttle and the black smoke bellers out and the load begins to get pulled. That's about like Holy Ghost prayer. And boy, you can feel the Holy Ghost and God working in that prayer closet. And I assure you, if God the Holy Ghost has got you praying about something, He's wanting to do something. Y'all yeah, reckon God heard the old prophet? Oh, you know He did. He's looking for understanding. Look with me. We got three minutes. Hallelujah. My brother's surprised I done this. <laughs> Yea, and I don't have time to deal with the prayer. Man, there's a lot about that prayer. But he opens up just like Solomon, that model prayer. He said, we have sinned. First thing he says, we have sinned. And look with me, verse 21, Daniel 9. Oh, my goodness, look what happens. Daniel's wanting to know what's going on. He really is. Daniel's wanting to understand it. He is seeking wisdom, understanding, and guidance. What James say? Let him that lacketh wisdom ask of God. Is that correct, men? 
We see it right here. Daniel is asking. He's begging for forgiveness. And he really gets down there in prayer. And if you look in verse number 18, he starts in that prayer again. And he says, oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. He's begging God to hear him. He's begging God to hear his voice. He's begging God to hear his plea. And look in verse 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touch me about the time of even oblation. You study that word swiftly there and it means to wear out. When Daniel began to pray, look at it. When Daniel began to pray, church, and notice verse 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understand at the beginning of thy supplication. As soon as he began to pray, God said, Gabriel, come here. And God gave Gabriel a commandment. And God caused him, it says, and being caused to fly swiftly. All right, Gabriel, put it in high gear, son. You get down there, that prophet. Yeah. And Daniel, man, how would y'all feel if Gabriel showed up in your closet and said, uh, for thou art greatly beloved. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something, church. I don't need Gabriel, and I respect Gabriel. I don't need Gabriel to show up in my prayer closet to tell me I'm greatly beloved. Yeah. He told me himself, I am greatly beloved this morning. I'm part of a bride this morning. And I'm telling you, he come down there and he told Daniel, he said, sir, you're greatly beloved. And Gabriel began to give Daniel what was fixing to happen. He gave it to him. Daniel was wanting to know what's going on. God said, I'll tell you what's going on. We fixing to rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel. And not only did he tell him we're fixing to rebuild Jerusalem, but he told him why. Messiah is coming. Brethren, I'm going to tell you, Messiah, our king is coming. Hallelujah. Amen. Things are happening and transpiring, and they are biblical. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't get too excited. And I'll tell you, these things ought to stir us to prayer. Amen. Amen. Preacher, you come on. Amen.